Hello, and your jongs. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. I'm Meng, and you're watching Meng's Barbershop, where we cut hair, have a few beers, and we talk. I couldn't get Cesar Milan on my show, sad face, but I did get the next best thing. This guy, he's been training canines and working with dogs for over 15 years. Welcome to our special guest, James. That's what we're going for. Bro, obviously. you going for a mullet? Well, yeah, kind of like a Viking mullet. Though. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's sick, man. I could do that. I'm working on the beard and shit, too. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Let me just show the camera, too. All right. So that they know like what we're going for. Button, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I'll get the tattoos and shit, but I don't even need the hat. Okay, yeah, let's put it up there. It's awesome. You can't beat fucking working for yourself, man. After <laughs> doing it for I mean, I still work, or? work, but you know what I mean? I still uh, have to pay the bills, but it's just, uh, I get to do this as my creative side thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I went out and I got some whiskey. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I forgot the chaser though. What do you need a chaser for? All right, no chaser. All right, cool. That's what I was talking about. <laughs> Dude, it's been forever. We got hit with that EIB. Should I stand up? <laughs> no, we're good, man. <laughs> Whoop, hold on, I touched a cord or something. Okay. Appreciate you. Hey, cheers, man. Cheers, Thank you for really being here. You. Thanks. Yeah. <sighs> Facebook stalking you for a minute there. <laughs> and uh, seeing you posting up videos and all that stuff. I knew you trained dogs, but I didn't know that you were like doing your own thing now. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember one of your posts and it actually said that you did uh, security for one of the presidents, mm -hmm. didn't you? Yep, a couple of times. So when I was a canine handler, um, that was one of the things that the Secret Service has their own um, detection dogs, but they don't have enough to support everything that they do, so they supplement with the military. And, and what branch were you in? I was at Air Force. All right. And so uh, it just depends on what the president's doing and what kind of support they need, but they give us a call. We got um, taskings to go all over the place. I had buddies that went to like Egypt and South America and... You know, when, when I was in Korea, they came through and um, some of our teams there were able to support. So bomb dogs are something that's kind of in short supply and you don't really care where you get them as long as you get them. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool job that way because it gives you the opportunity to work with so many different agencies and so many different other trainers and bits of experience that, you know, when you come from an environment where it's kind of no fail like that, mm -hmm, you know, you... Mm -hmm. It makes it really easy to teach a dog to run on the beach without a leash on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how did you even get into that, bro? Well, it was kind of by accident. So I went into the Air Force thinking I was just gonna do a couple of years and go to college and get out. And then uh, one of the days when I was out there doing my um, tech school for uh, security forces, which is like military police. Yeah. There was uh, a bunch of dogs running around out in one of our training areas. So I told uh, one of the instructors, I asked him, hey, what's going on over there? And he goes, you can do that if you know, you're not a complete turd and, you know, you carry your weight a little bit. Yeah. I was like, well, that's all I got to do. Shoot, sign me up. So from that moment on, that was in 2005. From that moment on, that was all I wanted to do. Oh, shit. Um, one of the rules of the Air Force was you had to have two years um, time in service to be able to apply. Mm -hmm. And so when I was at 18 months, I had, you know, been at the kennels, been getting chewed on, been spraying poop, you know, basically paying my dues to be able to get a, a letter of recommendation to mm -hmm. try to get in. How long did it take you to do that? Oh man, so I started at the 18 month mark. Um, yeah. or actually, I'm sorry, at about, um, at about my one year mark. Um, spent a lot of time out there, had a deployment in between, got back to it when I got back. Um, and then at the 18 month mark, the Air Force said, nope, sorry, you have to be in for the two years, so 24 months, you need to wait. Well, at the 20 month mark, I got deployed, so I ended up having to wait an extra seven months to be able to even put in for it. And then mm -hmm. the following year in 2009 was when I finally got to go to handler's course. So I started working with them um, back in 2007, um, just as, you know, like a kennel attendant or kennel aide or whatever. But, mm -hmm. uh, from there I worked my way up and got the opportunity to go and had a blast. It was fun. For that kind of work, uh, what's the best dog that you can get? And I mean, like what, what do you prefer working with, you know? For police work or? Yes, yes. Police Man. force work, yeah. It's not so much about the about the breed of dog, like generally as a preference, I'd say Malinois are generally more suited, more durable. 
more higher drive. Um, They're like German Shepherds, but more sleeker, right? Yeah, more like a version two, like a, mm -hmm. like all the bad stuff out of the German Shepherd and then all the good stuff kept and then a little bit of better stuff is filler. Mm. Um, don't get me wrong, I love German Shepherds. Like you see that um, big 90 pound one that I have, Otis, he's six years old and the biggest <laughs> baby teddy bear that I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, but he will absolutely wreck shop if you know somebody comes over messing with the baby. It's funny, tell him yeah. that the bad guy and his ears pop up and he looks around. So it's not about necessarily the the dog, you know, when you think about the goal of it, like I just mm -hmm. want a dog that wants to work for me and is happy to do what I need him to do, you know, mm -hmm. you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Sometimes the job isn't biting the bad guy. Sometimes the job is just making sure the bad guy doesn't run away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's a, a hard distinction for some, some dogs to learn and, mm -hmm. you know, some handlers too. It's a really type A dominated career field. So you got a bunch of guys that are full of piss and vinegar, so. <laughs> well, thank goodness you're more of a whiskey kind of guy, huh? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. You know, uh, you were one of the coolest cats in, in school, man. I'm telling you. Uh, I remember going to your place and just uh, the first, the first time I ever spent the night at a white person's house was your, your place, <laughs> yeah. man. For reals, man. And then your your mom made um, uh, uh, fried and eggs or something like that. I was yeah. like, what? You don't scramble these? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to scramble them? <laughs> Hell yeah! That was insane, man. Blew my mind. Love seeing all my buddies from high school like doing big things you know yeah yeah yeah. woody's still in the air force he's coming up on woody paul yeah oh bro yeah he's still doing good he's on facebook he pops up every now and then he stays okay. busy he's a firefighter okay firefighter in the air force yeah yeah wow yeah he's been all over the place too he was in we man we just missed each other it's such a small world mm. um i got sent over to japan to do uh background checks mm -hmm. for four months which was pretty dope because i was on okinawa just snorkeling every day and oh, man. checking up on people making sure that uh you know they were good kids it was really really yeah, yeah. a fun assignment yeah and uh he had just left right as i got there like i think we missed each other by a week Dang. And that was only because the air force was figuring that i needed to go to korea first and mm. then that got canceled and put us back like two weeks mm -hmm. so we were going to actually catch each other but it just the scheduling didn't work out so yeah yeah, yeah. and then he went to uh, jersey Dang, that's insane man yeah that's a that is a small pretty small world you know what i mean it's over there on the front. okay you want to do a shot real quick yeah yeah let's get another one perfect break yeah yeah it's perfect segue <laughs> my wife is like i don't know if you really thought this through because you're asking them to come by then you're taking shots then they're driving home it's like i mean well no i'm just gonna hang out for a while yeah yeah okay oh like wow that that's pretty high. yeah okay Got it. It's not like we don't go way back or nothing. We can hang out off camera, right? Oh, of course. Hashtag yeah. OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <sighs> Anytime the... Uh... When it's cold, is a lot better. Oh, yeah. It, always, it gets better as it's cold. Yeah. My, uh, my first Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach, Coach Ben, Jameson is his stuff. So every time we would hang out, that was... I'm gonna spray your hair. Coach Quick. Ben's thing. Yeah. Where's yeah. he from? Uh, he's out in Wichita Falls, Texas. He's another Air Force uh, dude that I ran into on my first deployment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At the time, he was doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu up in Alaska, and then, thanks to the Air Force, he kind of, you know, got to travel the country and the world doing Jiu Jitsu. And now he's got a really awesome gym out there in um, Wichita Falls, and really focuses and emphasizes like on coaching kids and developing them and that's awesome man not just the martial arts side of it like being a good human you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. man like i tell you like the most stand-up awesome kids you'll ever meet are uh coach ben's man those two kids are just amazing <laughs> definitely a good role model but, but yeah the dog training thing man we uh we got back here and Finally, in February, we were able to actually like do kind of a soft opening. We had a whole bunch of people that heard that we were back that wanted the the training. Mm -hmm. So I started to kind of see if there was any demand for it here because, you know, obviously the quality of dog trainers is quite the spectrum across the board and for it to be not worth it for me to do, but for me to be able to keep the lights on and do it. You know, I, I mean, bro, to, you, I gotta you, be get, able to, you, you get paid. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, I mean, it's something you did for your whole professional career, you know what I mean? So it definitely had to have been worth your while. Yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> up here, like, just the demand is, is so much different, you know, because, like, down there in Phoenix, like, dog trainers are on every single corner, so mm -hmm. it's, it's... It's like Starbucks, huh? 
Yeah, it's just super <laughs> competitive. And, you know, down there, like at the end of the day, like I feel like dog training should be affordable for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because like 40% of Americans have a dog and out of that 40%, 60% that have one have two. Yeah. So the the balance is, you know, being making it accessible to everybody, but still being able to make a living doing what I love, you know? Yeah. What's one of the hardest dogs that people have all the time that you you train and you're like, oh man, this dog again? I don't ever get that, man. It's There's no such thing as stubborn dogs. There's only spoiled ones. So mm. we, we as humans, like we forget that just 300 years ago, water was something we had to go walk to find. Yeah, yeah. Or we had to carry it on our back. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And our dogs, they're not hardwired for the luxuries that the human world kind of affords. Yeah. And so until we teach them, you know, really how to interact with all of that stimulus that, you know, me as a 35 year old human, I don't even do well in all the environments that we've created for ourselves. <laughs> um, you know, we really set the dog up for, for failure in a lot of ways with a lot of the commonly held beliefs with how we're supposed to train our dog. Yeah. And if we just reshape some of those to think about like, you know, what would we want in that situation or how would we react or what would our given perception be? It's a lot easier, but unfortunately we have to go against, you know, 20 or 30 years of just bad information pushed around on, you know, TV, social media, everything. Yeah, yeah. So like, Susan <clears throat> Malone was my guy. You know yeah. what I mean? He was everybody's guy. Yeah, yeah. That guy, man, he was like, yo, actually, that's actually how I learned how to train my dog too, mm -hmm. was uh, from Cesar Milan. Yeah. And like the touch and the snapping out and reading the body language of the dogs, like, I think everybody with the animal needs to watch some of his stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, uh, so he definitely delivers a given product, right? Mm -hmm. But the... Uh, Say what you mean, man. The principle, I'm trying to figure <laughs> out how to word it. Cause like, here's my thing. Like I, I understand dogs really well, but I don't yeah. communicate with humans super well at times. Uh -huh. so sometimes I gotta get, like, I gotta translate the shit. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so like Caesar operates from the belief that dogs are pack animals, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna do some exploring here. So Okay, <laughs> let's get him in. So we know that monkeys are how genetically similar to humans? Do you know off the top yes. of your head? Uh pretty pretty close, pretty similar. Like high, high 90s, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's like 97% were the same. So we see that a 3% difference, it's something like that, makes mm -hmm. a, a huge difference in appearance, social structure, communication. Everything that brain that, function, everything, everything yeah. that that species does, right? Even though yep. they're still so genetically similar to us. Mm -hmm. So dogs are, you know, 99 point whatever percent genetically similar to wolves, and we see that they share a lot of the same features: two mm -hmm. eyes, elongated mouth, four legs, tail. You know, even a Shih Tzu shares that to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, a Shih Tzu is not a wolf. I don't care what you, <laughs> I don't care how you package it. It's not a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So just like monkeys and humans, like we know that genetics and that, that deviation creates some differences. And I also understand that across the animal kingdom, there's species of dogs that aren't pack animals. Coyotes are social predators, dingoes are social predators, um, foxes are social predators. They'll get together and play and hang out or you know breeding time or whatever. But mm -hmm. as a rule, they're not just running around in a pack all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, a wolf pack is something kind of different, kind of like a pride of lions or um, any other group of animals that collectively works together to bring down game, right? Like mm -hmm. a wolf pack, they go after moose and elk and things that a coyote's not doing by himself. And because of that effort together, that's what, you know, kind of creates that group, group dynamic. But, I'm sorry, the buzzing's like... Oh, bro, I'm already, I'm, I'm feeling it too. It's I'm like, like hell in the zone. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling it like... All right, so anyway, the long and short of it, wolves yeah. are a pack animal. I yeah. don't debate that. Nobody debates that. We yeah. see it in zoos. We see it in the wild. Yeah. Um, the pack theory, the dominance hierarchy theory as we know it, comes from two Swiss scientists back in the 30s who observed a bunch of wolves in the zoo. And what they found was what we observe today. You know, mm -hmm. the dominant wolf takes control of all the resources. Mm -hmm. Everybody else just kind of falls into line, and that's how it goes. In the 60s, there was a dude um, named uh, Dr. David Meech. Well, at the time, he was a PhD candidate. He was writing his thesis on dominance hierarchy theory and basically doing another peer review to see is the original study accurate and um, is dominance and the dominance hierarchy theory what it was represented by those two Swiss dudes. And after his study of again wolves in the zoo and back in the 60s we didn't have the technology we have today he found basically the same thing that you know one dominant wolf takes control of all the resources and you know that's what we understood for uh, forever. Well, in 2010, that dude came out and he kind of re reversed his position. And he said, you know, in the time 
where we did the study, we didn't account for what wolves in the wild actually do. And wolves in the zoo are held there captive. They don't have mm. a choice. You mm -hmm. know, survival mm -hmm. is, you know, if your option is waiting to eat or getting your ass kicked and waiting to eat, well, you're going to wait to eat. So um, it's not necessarily how they function out in the wild, but that's how they function domestically because food is a scarce resource. In the yeah, zoo. Yeah, it's yeah. not something that's abundant out in the wild. And then unlike the pack out in the wild, they didn't work together to get it. So it's just competitiveness over who's going to keep it. You know mm -hmm, what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, you think of uh, think of family, they all eat dinner together, but if you own a business, even if you own the same business as your neighbor, you're still in competition, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the animal kingdom plays by that set of rules and um, wolves in a zoo, they assimilate as a survival mechanism mm -hmm. because again, they're not gonna just sit there and, you know, get alpha rolled every time. Yeah, um, yeah. And then once the dominant wolf is, you know, quote unquote full, the other ones kind of get in there and pick it, whatever, and they're just happy to have whatever's left. So they're too busy eating the scraps to fight with each other. Mm -hmm. In the wild, if there was, you know, tyranny like that, the pack would just leave, kill elk or deer or moose or whatever together and leave that one wolf that was being an asshole kind of by himself. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so that voluntary participation was a key thing that was overlooked. Now, because, you know, humans, we always like to say our pack, you know, what we <laughs> actually have is it very closely mimics a pack, you know, because the, the zoo doesn't let the wolf out of the zoo. Um, he doesn't get any freedom to run around and explore anything you know our dogs sure they get freedom to run around and explore but you know how much freedom does a, a dog on a leash ever really truly get you know what i mean as long as that leash you know that, whatever, that freedom yeah, whatever that is yeah yeah mm -hmm. um and the worse that he is on leash the less freedom that he gets because eventually the owner stopped taking him anywhere because he's you know too much to handle or you know being difficult or whatever the case may be yeah so you know they really don't get to experience much freedom and um you know the the similarities between a pack and a domesticated dog are behaviorally similar, but it's not because dogs are a pack animal. It's just because environmentally we create the same conditions that a wolf in a zoo encounters. Mm -hmm. um, no different than what a whale or a dolphin encounter at SeaWorld. You know, the, they don't have the, the full ocean to explore. They have, you know, whatever respective tank that they're in, albeit it might be a big tank. It might be at the perfect temperature for them. You know, they might get an unlimited amount of fish delivered, but it's still a tank, right? Yep, so, yep. They have the freedom to do whatever they want in there, but do they really have freedom? I think not. And then you think about us and look at our tank. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you, you found a passion that you're working at and towards. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, for real, it's so hard, anybody and everybody, to find something that they wake up every day and say, hey, you know, I really enjoy doing this, you know? It's oh, something man. that I'm really passionate about, so. That's awesome, bro. Oh, bro, I love it. Like every day I wake up, I get to go play with dogs all day. And then <laughs> like the other day, I got a text from um, some folks that I did a, a turnover with, man. Roddy is super awesome. He's the sweetest dog ever. He's like mm -hmm. any Roddy, he gets super vocal. Mm -hmm. um, he does have a history to him that, you know, is kind of consistent with the Roddy. Um, and they couldn't have the Roddy, the Roddy puppy, the kids, the whole family in the house because it just was too much for him. And you kind of get, you know, not aggressive, but he would start getting a little bit chompy and they mm -hmm. obviously can't have that around puppy and kids and everything. So he yeah, kind of, yeah. you know, gets relegated to being the outside yeah. guard dog. And, you know, that's great, but everybody doesn't get a dog to be a guard dog. They get the dog to be a pet, right? And unfortunately, yeah. we just sometimes can't find a pathway to get there. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the training, I trained up both of the dogs. Now that dog is able to go into the house and relax and he lives um, or he lays on the on his bed by the fire and you know, gets attention and loves from the boys. They sent me some pictures of him uh, and them in front of the fire. And, you know, it was it was really awesome because they said that they had never been able to do that before. So just being able to provide that to owners where, or, you know, people where they can now have their whole family together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really what it's about. And What are the essential things that dogs should learn and you should teach first? <clears throat> All right, you ready for me to blow your mind? Yes. All right, so what would you do if you won the lottery tomorrow? Um... I would, I actually thought about this. I would get an attorney or somebody to help me with, um, with all the finance part of it, the legal side of it. And then I would start allocating money to my family. So taking care of, taking care of your family, right? Yes. Yes. So are you doing anything you don't want to do ever again? Uh, no, I'm never going to do anything I don't want to do ever again. Why not? Because I got the fuck you money. You know what I mean? You got that fuck you money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that fuck you money basically means that your needs are met for life. Shelter. Yes clothing, food, your basic needs, uh, biologically speaking, are met, right? Yes. So if you won the lottery tomorrow and your biological needs were met forever, um, mm -hmm. that would give you the confidence to be able to be like, all right, cool, I ain't doing shit I don't want to do. Yep. 
I'm going to take care of my legal affairs, do what I want to do, take care of my family and my team, and we good. Mm -hmm. On the other side of that coin, if you know the economy was doing really, really bad, mm -hmm. and you had an old boss that hit you up, and you couldn't get um, an interview anywhere, and you were just looking for work to be able to put food on the table, keep lights on. Yep. Old boss at you know a shitty concrete job that it's 120 degrees in Phoenix, and you don't want to do. He says, "Hey, I got some work. Are you down?" I would be down. You're down now, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So, because of you know the need to survive and the the access to those resources you're inclined now to do things that you wouldn't normally want to do right yes all right so keep that in mind okay <laughs> so the first thing that we got to teach a dog is how to work for their food when we bring our dogs home okay. um, all too often our because we as humans we have a dog we have a responsibility to take care of the dog and part of the responsibility to take care of the dog includes feeding it right just like yes. our kids yep um so twice a day three times a day whatever that was real quick But basically, it's looking like this. Hell yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> so the bag needs to grow in yeah. a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. But there's a the sides. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing where it's, it needs to go up more or go down more or whatever. So because it's not actually a full, full, um, you know, like um, mullet yet, right? Yeah. With the dad bod. The dad, <laughs> it's a... Viking dad bod. Yeah, exactly. It, so I faded it. But in the picture, it's actually just a... A skin all the way down you know what i mean but i it's it's faded up so that you can comb it over and do uh things with it still until your hair fully grows in oh you're the so, expert yeah so so this side is cut exactly the same on this side so you can fold it over one side you can fold it the other side you know what i mean all Hell that yeah. stuff yeah so i'll just um, keep coming up every couple of weeks now touching up the sides yeah yes 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 yeah <laughs> i'm disabled now bro i uh i got the placard and everything Oh, shut up. Yeah, for real. It's cool. I was gonna, I was gonna give you some shit when I pulled out. Like, you ain't got no handicap park in there? <laughs> oh, crap, man. Um, what happened? I mean, you get injured over there or somewhere or? No, just a career of fucking, we're, sorry, I'm trying, I'm trying to cuss. Um, it's okay, I can beep anything out. Uh, a career of getting chewed on and mm. running around with a bunch of heavy, uh, heavy equipment on and oh, okay. vests, plates. The bite suit was really the biggest toll. Yeah. Um, they, even though you have all that stuff, you still feel them, right? Well, I mean, you're getting hit by an animal that weighs 50 to 75 pounds, mm -hmm. going 35 miles an hour, mm -hmm. and you're catching that in your shoulder mm. 20 to 100 times a day some days. Dang. So it just, wear, it just wears you down. It's a lot of just wear and tear. Um, mm -hmm. Both mm -hmm. the shoulders got a ton of arthritis. My hips have arthritis. Um, I've got compressed and herniated discs in my mid spine. Um, I got bit on my hand, so I've got like nerve and tendon damage there. Mm -hmm. uh, both my ankles like sprains and, do I need my head back more? Would that help? No, 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 you're good, you're good. That would you got a long neck, bro, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's actually a little more comfortable. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just got a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of shit. Mm figure out why what we did in the military was able mm -hmm. to produce because it ultimately comes down to the result right like the yes. dog training is all about results yes so when i go down range and i i take a dog with me i mm -hmm. need to have a whole bunch of confidence that he's gonna find anything that's gonna fucking blow up around me right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, without that confidence i'm probably not doing that job yeah now the dog he doesn't know what the hell he's doing he's happy as hell just to look for his kong and that's the yeah. beauty about their innocence is they I think if they knew what we were doing, they would tell us to fuck off. Oh, dude, definitely. Um, so as far as he's <laughs> concerned, he's just looking for his Kong and to have a good time with me. Yeah. Um, but again, I have to have that confidence in his ability. So Kong is a toy. Yeah, the little, okay. the little yeah. Uh, Kong. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because saying Kong over here and I'm freaking three <laughs> shots in. I'm like, what the, what Kong? <laughs> what, Donkey Kong. <laughs> what is the Kong? It's the Kong, bro. <laughs> oh, yeah. So anything that you want to tell um any tips or anything like that on life on being a man on anything that you want oh, to say here's your chance to say it i guess the only advice that i would feel comfortable weighing in on would be uh dog training if you're looking to make a better relationship with your dog first establish some scarcity in that resource make your dog work for food again if he thinks he won the lottery he ain't going to want to do anything he don't want to do so establish some scarcity make him work for it work can be as simple as sitting and downing um, but just because you put down the bowl and he sits when you tell him to I go to a restaurant, the waiter tells me where to sit, he tells me to wait there and he brings me out my food. Um, that doesn't mean that I actually, you know, consider him in some sort of authoritative position over me, mm -hmm. right? So same mm -hmm. thing with our dogs. Just because they sit and they wait for their dinner patiently, 
you could still be the waiter at the restaurant. You need to actually be the signer of the check. The dog just has to understand that the food is the currency and the work is chilling. Simple enough. Dang, that's deep, man. Hey, thanks for tuning in for this episode here. Uh, all the links for this guy, if you're interested in getting your dog trained up and things like that, will be in the description. So uh, stay tuned and until next time, see you guys. Laters.